Welcome to Fearless, Do More, the podcast where we dive into the minds of some extraordinary and fearless businesses and people, people who are challenging the status quo and who are helping to change the world of business around us. I'm your host, Jill Hunter. I'm the managing partner at Square One Law. On each episode, I'll be chatting to innovators, change makers, and trailblazers, where we explore the unique journeys of our guests. We'll delve into the fears they face, the setbacks they've overcome, the lessons they've learned along the way. We'll uncover the secrets behind their resilience and we'll find out what motivates them to keep going, even in the face of adversity. We'll also have a few laughs along the way too. My guests are all leaders who relentlessly pursue their passions, not only to create a better tomorrow, but who inspire us to push our own boundaries, those who fear less and do more. Hi everyone and welcome to um, this episode of our podcast um, and today I have with me one of my favourite Northeast women, Hufti. Hi Hufti. Hi Jill. Welcome. Thank you. So your main day job is running the West End Women and Girls Centre. Yep. Um, for those who aren't aware of the centre, can you just sort of briefly tell us what, what the centre does? Yes, so we uh, were the first and are still the only open access women and girls centre uh, in Newcastle. So started in 1991 and we run group work in the morning for women and youth clubs in the evening for girls. We run courses, domestic abuse support. Uh, we've got a community garden, we cook, we eat together. It's about creating community. Brilliant. So. Where did that, if you're the only one in Newcastle, where, where did that come from? Where did that idea start? So in 1991, there were millions of youth clubs around. Uh, it was like pubs on every corner. There was a youth club or a community centre, but they were all like mini work and men's clubs. So you played pool, darts or football. And the girls were either behind the talk shop or waiting at the front door for their boyfriends to come out. So, um, yeah, they weren't very conducive for women and girls to have a good time. So lots of girls in Elswick were hanging around street corners. And in them days, Elswick was the red light district. So the girls were all being propositioned by men. So the women and community activists decided to set up a girls' night. So we set up a girls' night in the local swimming pool, Elswick Pool, which had just been built in 1991 and had the first leisure centre female manager in the Northeast. So she was very encouraging. Set up a girls' night. We invited a load of girls. We didn't know if anybody would come. They all came with their two pea subs. And the week after that, they all brought their little sisters because they said, me mom says I can't come without her. <laughs> and then the week after that, they all brought their mams, their nanas, their aunties. Everybody wanted to see what was going on. And it, it took off from there, basically. And I mean, you know, Elswick was an area at that time with lots of different communities, lots of um, people, you know, people who didn't speak the same language, um, had completely different cultures. How, how, how did that work, bringing everybody together? Yeah, so that we realised um, that we were a very white club. Um, so we did, and we have a massive Bengali population in Elswick. Um, and so we started knocking on doors and going, you know, we've got a women and girls centre here. We do loads of things. Why don't you come? And uh, my colleague Emma kept going, oh, look, they're, they're, they're planting in the back outside the house. Oh, that's coriander. How did you manage to grow that? And I was all, Emma, will you shut up? We're trying to talk to them <laughs> about why they're not coming to the centre. And then we'd move on to the next house and they'd have a toilet outside with like lovely flowers and plants growing out of it. And Emma would be going, here's this mooly. What's this? How are you growing this? So in the end, it turned out that the Bengali women wanted a space to grow because they just had backyards and lived in flats, so which is why they were growing outside. So we got the council to give us a bit of land in Elswick Park, and we set up a community garden. And all the Bengali women came, and they planted seeds from home that they bought from Bangladesh. And um, we didn't know what was grown in the garden until it, uh, we came to harvest it. And then we were all, what, what is this? How do we cook with this? What does this taste like? So then we went into the kitchen and the Bengali women cooked uh, with us and taught us recipes. And then, uh, yeah, we started with cookery and, and, and growing our own food and has turned into a really, really multicultural centre. 
I mean, I've been to the centre loads of times. It's a really inspiring place to come because um, it is really somewhere where you feel that there's a, a real sense of community. Everybody there um, is very diverse, they're very different, but all of those differences are what make it special and everybody celebrates those, di those differences. Um, what do you think the, the trick is in, in creating that inclusive community? Well, I think what we're very lucky about is that all of our workers are from the local community. We're all from the local community. My board of trustees is from the local community. So the centre is run by and for the community. So it's not like we parachuted into an area and gone, oh, what, what would you like? It's like people don't stop telling us what they want. So, uh, and then we provide it. So it, it comes from the community, so that's what it's about. So everybody has a voice and everybody is listened to. And um, yeah, sometimes that can get very loud and noisy, but what that makes is, a, is community. That makes us all equal. We're all the same. So everybody has an equal voice and what happens is a consensus. And that's, that is what makes a good community tick. And I've never been to an AGM like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfect demonstration of, of what you're talking about. You know, it is the community who are making the decisions about what happens with the, with the centre, you know, and, and when everybody buys into that and everybody's relatively well behaved and, uh, <laughs> and but there's healthy debate and you get stuff done. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's that's a brilliant part of, of, of what you what you do. And, it, you know, you've done some fantastic projects I mean, during COVID. You tell us a bit about what happened during COVID. Yeah, um, well, we all got sent home like everybody else and we had a work WhatsApp group and Susan the cook, who uh, lives up the road, she was she was all, oh, I've made a lovely pan of soup, I'm dropping it down to me mams. Uh, and then Caitlin, one of the staff went, oh, my nana lives on the way, will you drop her a, will you drop her a bowl off on her doorstep, Susan, while you're on your way to your mother's? Susan said, yeah, and then Sophie went, Oh, the Ben's sick, Susan. Can you drop me a bowl off? And and I was all, oh, someone starting here. Look at this. People need soup. People need connection. So <laughs> I rang Susan. I went, right, come on, we're going back to work. So we went back into the centre and Susan made uh, pans of soup. And at first it was just me and Susan. And Susan was terrified. She was all, what if the police stop her? What if somebody goes, where are you going? We're in national lockdown. We're not supposed to be out the house. And I went, Susan, it's fine. So uh, Caitlin and all the young'uns put on Facebook um, soup for the community. Who wants some soup? Uh, and by the end of the first week, we had 500 people we were delivering soup to. Um, so, and we had to work out a system of how to do it. So Susan made the soup. We had crates with a pan of soup in, um, a, a ladle and a jug. And we said to people, leave a bowl or a pan on your doorstep and we'll knock when we filled it. So people would go, I need three portions, I need 10 portions. So, and we ended up in 15 months delivering 25,000 portions of soup. And Susan does never want to see another bowl of soup again in her life. She's absolutely <laughs> sick of soup. <laughs> Let's hope we don't have another lockdown. She'll have to find something else to make for yeah. everybody. <laughs> yeah. Sandwiches next time. <laughs> and, and another thing I always find very inspiring about the centre is the individual stories. You know, you've got some some real individuals' lives who've been changed by the work that you've done. This isn't just about, like you say, it's not a youth club, it's not just a place where people come together, it's where you make real change and real difference. Um, can you tell us about some of the, the, the individuals, for example, some of the domestic abuse workers that you've got and, and their, their stories and how they've transformed their lives through what you've done? Yeah, so um, like I say, everything comes from the local community. Uh, and we've always had women who've come into the centre and during cookery sessions or while we're gardening, we'll talk about what's going on in their family lives and talk about um, the abuse that they're suffering at home and what's going on. So I would, me and the other staff would have conversations and talk about it, but actually what we needed was specialists. So we developed a domestic abuse uh, service with specialist staff. Um, and I've always run the teenage girls, the older girls, which is actually happening tonight. I love the teenage girls. Uh, they're my favourite group in the centre. They're wild and crazy. <laughs> and uh, you just hear, they're just at that age where 
They're just, you know, discovering life, discuss, discovering themselves, what they want to be doing, what they don't like. And they're very clear in telling you all of that, which is great. So the teenage girls at that time we were working with, I was really concerned about them. They'd be on their mobiles. It was the time of uh, Blackberries. So they were on their Blackberries, BBs all the time. And they were, um, I was all, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? And they were all, all my boyfriends just checking in. And I was all, every five minutes, put your phone down. And they were all, no, no, you'll, you'll get angry if I put my phone down. And then somebody else was taking selfies. And I was all, what are you doing? And they were all, my boyfriend needs to make sure there's no boys in the room with me, that it's a girls only club. And I was all, oh, this is, this is ridiculous. Then I had boyfriends knocking on the door, going, what time does this finish? Hofty war last needs to come come home and cook me tea. And these, we're talking about 13, 14, 15 year old girls. So I was all that. So we ran, I did, just developed a course called Safe for Life, which is a domestic abuse recovery course for women. And we, uh, I went, oh, we've got to try it with the girls, see if it works with teenagers. We knew it worked with women, but let's test it on the lasses. So I went, right, we're running a course, want you to tell us it's a test tell us if you like it if you get it what you think about it so we ran it for 12 weeks solid and they absolutely loved it there's one girl who's now my deputy center coordinator who um when we did the self-esteem session something clicked in her and she just went oh my god hofty i have got this 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 is going to change my life and it absolutely has she is so strong so confident and she, at 24 she's the deputy center coordinator she's absolutely amazing so that was just a little trigger for her that she needed to go yeah i understand self-esteem now i understand why i'm undoing myself why society's undoing me i understand what i need to do to be strong and then we had other young women who would all or oh, I'm experiencing domestic abuse. This is coercive control in my relationship. And the majority of girls in that group were in coercive control in relationships, not because they were different from anybody else. A lot of teenage girls were in coercively controlling relationships, unfortunately, to this day. Um, and if you start off in a coercively controlling relationship, and you think that's normal and nobody goes, this isn't normal, then that continues into later life. So the girls were all, oh my God, right, he's waiting outside the door. Hufty, go and tell him to do one. I'm not coming out while he's waiting for me. Uh, so I'll be at the door going, no, nope, she's not coming out. Well, what are you going to stay all night? And I was all, if we stay all night, we're staying all night, but you need to do one. So me and the lasses were got really passionate about this and the Girls were brilliant. They went, okay, we need to be doing this in our schools. So they went into schools and they delivered the course and they said to teachers, can we have a lunchtime? Can we have a classroom at break time? And they started delivering the course to other girls. And then they, they went, well, look, we've been doing this. It's time to leave school now. I don't fancy university. What about a job, Hufty? So then I had to go round and Vera Baird was the police and crime commissioner at the time. I went to Vera, Vera came and met the girls and Vera was uh, inspired by their passion and went, yeah, hopefully there's some fun and employ these lasses. So then they got jobs, then they started to go in wider um, and they train young women as domestic violence champions. So we've got over 2,500 domestic violence champions, young women in schools, universities, colleges, youth clubs across the Northeast who then support other young women. So it's about that creating community and then letting it letting it flow out, letting it um, diversify, letting it move out and make change happen. And do you, I mean, you do a lot of um, campaigning, obviously, around domestic violence and anti-misogyny pro projects. Do you think things are changing? Now, that's an interesting question, Jill. So it's interesting, isn't it, because I think we continue to struggle with domestic abuse and misogyny. I think it's about behavior change. I think it's about sharing knowledge and um, strength and building the power of women and girls to say, no, this is wrong. 
And I think that's what we're doing. Sometimes it can feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall. Um, but I think, I think somebody said to me the other day, Hufti, has anything changed? And we're doing all this work. But when we run the Safe for Life course, um, and you see women starting um, on the course on week one, and then you see that growth and change to week 10, where they've graduated from the course, and they are, they are changing their lives. And when you see young women uh, becoming inspiring role models um, and painting the outside of buildings and going, no, we're not standing for this. And when you see social media and you see them standing up to misogyny on social media, I think it's drop by drop, brick by brick, we're breaking that down. I think it's a massive job, but I think we've got to have hope that um, we are making change happen because without hope, then you become hopeless. And we'll just stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and I think, but watching young women come through who were inspiring, who were strong, who were great role models, I think that's what, what gives us all hope that there is change. And uh, there is like young women who are going everywhere in the country and every community um, across the world going, no, we're not standing for this anymore. No, I completely agree. I think the role model bit's really, really important because you, particularly in communities like, like that you've worked in, quite often there aren't female role models and there's quite often negative role models because people are in a cycle of domestic abuse and coercive controlling relationships and they see that that's the way their, their mother, their grandmother ha had relationships with men and, and, and that's all sort of self-perpetuating, isn't it, down the, down, the, down the line. So I think the role model thing's really really important and, and you obviously as a, as a, a woman leading a business an organization mm -hmm. um you're a you're a role model for for the girls as well what's what's the in five words what's the most important thing about leading the organization for you um it's it's funny to talk about yourself isn't it or funny to think about i mean uh, what we always say is consistency is really important when you work in communities because it's about being that same person. So you've got someone, so I've been there like coming up 40 years now. So I think it's about always being there. So it's not a worker who's changing all the time. It's not someone new every year or every couple of years. It's someone who is there. So, so there's consistency. Um, passion. I'm really passionate. And sometimes that can come across as a bit, right, let's paint the zebra cross in orange. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of, so I'm like that. I'm very passionate, but I've got all these mad ideas, which is why I've got a great staff team who will go, okay, Hufty, perhaps not today. Um, we might need to plan that one a little bit. So my, uh, passionate, um, and you've got to, you've got to be resilient. I think you've got to be resilient, whether it's a business or a community center or whatever you do in life, you always experience knockback. So, um, and you know what we, as you've seen yourself, Jill, we have a laugh. Yeah, that's what, yeah, yeah. that's what we do. We have a laugh. You can be talking about the serious of subject, but women together, um, of all ages, there's always a funny story. There's always humor. And food as well. Food is really important. Uh, we eat together. So, and growing your own food and cooking creates community. So, what's the funniest story you've had from from women? Oh, Mrs. Robinson, who um, is the big hall in 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 the centre, is named after Mrs. Robinson. She was one of the women who came on the very first night, uh, brought her daughter, and then on the third night was sitting there with all her female family around her five generations of Mrs. Robinson's family come to the centre. And um, so we named the big hall after her. Sadly, she's passed now, um, but we all have a, a, a memory with her. So her photograph is behind the bar um, and all of her uh, five generations, whenever there's a, a new child born or a birthday, they'll go, Hufty, can I hire me Nana's hall, please? And I'm all, yes, of course you can. Mrs. Robinson was hilarious. She'd always, whenever we go, we always go to South Shields on a trip the last week of the school summer holidays. We always get coach loads and, and we go down, we have a barbecue. 
Mrs. Robinson uh, would try and sell the burgers. I'm trying to make money for the centre, Hufty. A pound a burger, roll up, roll up. And I was all, Mrs. Robinson, stop it. It's just for the women and girls. And then, you know, when we'd have plays on in the centre, Mrs. Robinson would be in the front row. And Mrs. Robinson would have this. And it was great because it made other people feel comfortable. But whenever there was a play on and say there was something, there was domestic abuse in the play, Mrs. Robinson would laugh. It was a natural reaction. She'd laugh out loud. There was one play we watched and there was a coffin and somebody had died. Mrs. Robinson couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. And she sits in the front row. So everybody's all, this is terrible. Who's that old woman who's <laughs> laughing at the front? We go, no, it's, it's Mrs. Robinson. But she had this, that was her reaction. Yeah. So if something terrible happened, she'd laugh. And a lot of people actually have that reaction. So it made everybody else feel quite comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. And now when we have plays or the annual general meeting at the centre, we have a reserved sign that we put in the front row and it's reserved for Mrs. Robinson. Oh, that's brilliant. That's a brilliant memory, uh, sort of um, tribute to her, isn't yeah. it? To have that, yeah. that's brilliant. And I mean, you've done, you've done some brilliant things. I mean, so it, tell me about the farm. Yeah, so after COVID, when we were delivering soup uh, and we had loads of volunteers cooking the soup and then delivering the soup out in the community, I mean, um, people people would come and go out. I'd love to volunteer for the soup run. I've been, you know, furloughed at work. I'd be all great, great. So, and I'd explain the, the, the structure of how it worked and go, right, so we've got these trays of, of big pans of soup and you put them in the back of your car. Oh, I've got an Audi. That doesn't matter. Just put put the soup in the back of it. What if it spills? <laughs> <laughs> I was all, well, this is how we do it. Oh, I don't, I don't think I can do that. And I was all, oh, all right then. But then we had other people who were just all, yeah, pile of soup in. And then because sometimes you do have to stop and, you know, one woman, just a car, just smelt of soup. For, I think it probably <laughs> still smells of soup today because she spilt the soup everywhere and she wasn't at all bothered, but a car just smells of soup whenever you get in it. So, um, but yes, so we were all delivering the soup. We were talking to women who were living in flats, no outside space, uh, five kids, homeschooling the kids. The kids were doing her head in. She was doing the kids' heads in. Um, no green space at all anywhere to get out to. So we were all, how are we going to manage? This is ridiculous. You know, what's going to happen? And then, you know, when there were bits of like um, lessening of the lockdown and people could go out and then people were talking about going on holidays and then you were with families who can't afford a holiday. There's nowhere they can go. So we were all, what we discovered in the, in the lockdowns and in COVID was you need three things to survive. You need food, you need fun and you need freedom. So we went, how can we have these three things? What can we do to develop something around food, fun and freedom? So we went, oh, let's get a farm. It was mad. We just went, let's get a farm. Oh, yeah, we need the countryside. We need to breathe fresh air. We need to see green, blue skies. We need to run around mad. Um, and, and we all just went, yeah, let's get a farm then. <laughs> so we started asking around. And um, my colleague, Jill, is actually from the countryside. Uh, so she knew farmery people. So, and then she came back one day and went, there's an empty farm around the corner from me mother's. Uh, shall we go and have a look at it? And I was all, well, who does it belong to? And she said, the National Trust. We've got a meeting with them. So we, me and Jill drove up to the farm and it's in the middle of a forest. So took well, like 15 minutes, didn't see another person. Like I was all, oh my God, where we're going? And then we came out of this clearing into this beautiful kind of big sky, amazing space. And when we were walking around the National Trust, we're going, well, so this is the farmhouse and this is the wind turbine and it's all off grid. And and they were all, we'll leave you to have a look around. So they all left. And I was all, Jill, oh my God, I think they're going to give it to us. <laughs> and Jill went, yeah, it sounds like it, doesn't it? So, like, literally from that first meeting, the National Trust went, right, we're drawing up a lease. Here you go. 20-year lease um, on a farm, which gives us the opportunity to really make a difference up there. We can put our own stamp on it. You know, we're working with architects to um, the brilliant rider architecture who are giving us pro bono support to uh, develop 
the outbuildings into bunkhouses and sleeping areas for women and families to come up for holidays. So, and um, for women who experience domestic abuse to come and get some respite with their families, with their kids. And um, it's mad. I mean, uh, this summer, when we had the girls, the, the Tuesday club, the junior girls club, where it all started. So they're all primary school girls, five to 11 year olds. And we took a big coach up and we were all the coach drivers. It's the coach drivers, the same company we've used for 40 years. And they normally take us to South Shields and we went, can we have a coach, but this is the track. And the coach driver was all, might take me an hour to get up the track, Hufty, but we'll get there. <laughs> so we had like 56 girls in a coach and we op we got to the farm and we opened the coach door and the girls just ran out, just ran out screaming, running around screaming, like just, and like it took about an hour to herd them all back in because they just were all, wow, look at this. And they did, and that's what you want. It's nothing better than seeing 56 primary school age girls running around the field screaming. <laughs> In the end, I was like, you can't scream by that lamb's face. Just, <laughs> just come away from the lamb when you scream. Stay away from the lamb. Because <laughs> yeah. the lambs and the sheep were all, oh my God, what's this? But yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I, 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 I was going to ask you what, what gets you out of bed in the morning, but... You know, you can see how passionate you are about about what you do. Um, do you think this is something you'll ever stop doing? Well, it's interesting because I'm getting older, and I keep saying to all the younger stuff, "I'm getting older." Um, you know, I, I will have to pack it in one day. Who's going to take over? And they're all every time I say that they leave. <laughs> <laughs> they go to university, or they go, "No, I'm traveling the world now, Hofty." Um, or you know, they. And I don't want to scare anybody, but yeah, at some time I'm, I, I will I will pack it in. Um, I might still come uh, as a member, uh, you know, and and come to cookery and gardening and um, let somebody else drive the minibus. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I'll I'll always be a member of the centre. Well, it's just such a massive part of your life, isn't it? It it's, is. Uh, I mean, you know, it's. Um, I think the first time I ever saw you, there was in a very different capacity. Yes. Um, Back in uh, back in the was it late eighties or early nineties? Early nineties, um. early nineties. Yes. Yeah. So I was at uni, and we used to come back after we'd been out for a night out and put the word on. Yes. Watch people eating other people's toenails and things yes. to be on TV, mm -hmm. and and one of the other main features was to see um, our Geordie Trailblazer <laughs> <laughs> going round as the roving reporter. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. So, um, well, I I did stand up. So uh, way back in Newcastle in the late 80s, when alternative comedy was starting, um, there were a couple of little clubs in the uh, Broken Doll and uh, actually the Rose and Crown in the Egypt Cottage yeah, around yeah. the East End as well. And we used to run, uh, we used to run comedy nights. And um, so I used to get up and have a bit of a laugh. Uh, and then, and I used to write a column for the Crack magazine as well, Queer Crack. I used to write the gay column for them. And uh, the editor of The Crack said, oh, the word are looking for a new um, a new person, a new presenter. Uh, we think you should go for it, Hufty. They have no auditions in the Northeast. So I went, oh, why not? So I went for that and uh, I got a call back, uh, which was a phone call conversation. And then I got another call back, which was Channel 4 in London. And that was... Uh, being a presenter in front of a live audience um, uh, and testing testing me out. And there were a number of other people there. And then after that, there were more conversations. And eventually, I went for a meeting in London at the headquarters of Planet 24, who made uh, the word. And uh, the receptionist, while I was waiting to go in, and I was all, how long is this taking? This is, you know, I must be near the end now. I must be, like, getting down to the final few. And the receptionist was all to me. Um, she said, so uh, I just need to confirm your details for payroll and for <laughs> taxis and stuff like that. And I was all, have I got the job then? And she was all, oh, my God. So she shouldn't have said any of that to me. I think that conversation was on the way out of the office <laughs> rather than on the way in. So I got the job. Um, and yeah, it was, it was the weirdest thing in the world. But you were running the centre at the same time, weren't yes, you? Yes, I was. I was. So, um, 
one of uh, my great workers who's been there a very long time, Emma Glasses, she was hanging around at the time. So I was all, she was volunteering actually, and she just finished uni. I was all, Emma, um, I've got this job where I've got to go to London. So um, can you like run the Tuesday club for me? And she was all, yeah, of course. So, and Pat, our longstanding volunteer was there. So um, yeah, I would do the Tuesday club on Tuesday night. And then generally I'd go to London on the train on Thursday. And then on Friday we'd rehearse and then it was live, live on Friday night. And then I get the train back on Saturday. And then on the Tuesday club, all the girls were all, Hofty, will you wave to me on Friday night? <laughs> and I was all, you shouldn't even be watching this, man. <laughs> You're like six. Don't watch this programme. <laughs> and what did Mrs. Robinson think of it? Oh, Mrs. Robinson absolutely loved it. <laughs> Mrs. Robinson kept a scrapbook of me. Um, and so she'd anything she'd seen in the papers, she'd cut out and she'd bring to the Tuesday club and she'd go, Huffy, this is what they said about you. It's terrible. I'm going to write them a letter of complaint. <laughs> but this is a good one, Huffy. They liked you in this one. So she kept a scrapbook for me. But I mean, you were it was groundbreaking at the time. The word was groundbreaking because it was the first time it was about, you know, I'll do anything to get on TV was the sort yes. of key, key, key theme. And that now has been taken to the extremes with reality TV. Yeah. But also from an inclusivity point of view, you were the first openly gay woman on TV, effectively. I mean, that's, that's, quite, that's quite something to have that as an achievement. Yes, it is. And I was so proud as well. Yeah. And I think they... I think the producers were very clever. Um, I think they completely, you know, they had Terry Christian, who was a bit of a wild boy, and and he was always in the pub until five to ten <laughs> or five to eleven when uh, we were due to start filming. He was dragged out of the local pub, uh, but he was great, Terry. He was great crack and a really good bloke. Uh, so they did. They had Danny Bear, Amanda Decadne. You know, they had a glamorous woman. You know, um, Amanda Decadne was only about four. 14. When she started, yeah. 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 It's incredible, isn't it? It's, yeah. 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 I met Amanda um, when uh, Duran Duran were playing Wembley and they said, oh, you're going to go and cover it, uh, Duran Duran playing Wembley. You're going to be backstage. Amanda's going to introduce you to the band. And uh, yeah, I mean, Naomi Campbell was there. It was just, I was like, oh my God, look where <laughs> I am. <laughs> Now, you see, if it had been the days of mobile phones, you would have had a load of selfies to take back to the Tuesday Club. But, yes, uh, <laughs> exactly. No, it was way before then. <laughs> so, I mean, you've had a fascinating life. You've got a brilliant, fascinating career um, with the centre and you're doing great stuff. What, what's next? Well, I don't know. More, more exciting things at the centre, I think. Um, we've got the farm now, so it's about establishing that making um the beautiful outbuildings for for holidays um getting some more i mean every time we go up it's mad isn't it we've got some sheep and we've got some hens and ducks but then the girls are all huffy can we have a donkey please <laughs> and but i'm the same i'm all i want a donkey when can we get a donkey oh, you get a rescue donkey well exactly yeah. so but then people are going to me well it's about making a house for the donkey hufty mm. and then we need to make sure that we have enough water because we the we're fed by a spring. So the spring water needs to be for Jill and her daughters to drink, not for numerous donkeys and goats <laughs> and, and all the things that me and the girls want. So I, I do, again, have to be hufty. Let's just wait till we get the irrigation system in. I'm all, me and the girls are all, donkeys, donkeys, look at the donkeys. <laughs> girls are coming to me and going, there's a donkey for sale, hufty. Can we get this donkey? And, you know, it's hard to say no. So there's that. Um, we want to... Um, we're talking to the Metro, uh, Nexus. They have got a brand new suite of Metro carriages. I remember when I was at school, I was on the Metro for the first time. We were like a test little class um, on the very first Metro trains. Um, and now they're getting a whole new suite of Metro trains. So we're talking to Nexus about maybe getting the Metro carriage. Um, making it into a cafe in Alzac Park. Oh, brilliant. Um, for all Susan the cook and all the wonderful women who volunteer with us to be starting small businesses. Um, so Bengali curry nights, um, Greek nights with Sylvia. Um, we've got a woman who makes Colombian food. So little pop-ups in the Metro Cafe. Um every evening and then they can establish their own businesses and move on 
um, to get bigger premises if they work. So we're talking about that. Um, I'd love to run um, a women's taxi firm by women for women because I think women's safety is really yeah, important. Yeah. And to this day, and it's just awful, a load of teenage girls I work with start going drinking in the town. Obviously, we live in Elswick. It's close enough. But instead of getting a taxi home, they'd rather walk home because they don't feel safe in taxis. Mm. And there are many stories that we've heard about women and girls getting into unlicensed, but also licensed taxis and being sexually assaulted. So to stop that, a women's taxi firm. Women in Elzik need flexible employment. They need employment that's in shifts around when their kids are at school, when they've got childcare. So if we could run a female taxi firm, I think that would be a benefit for women drivers, but also a benefit for the community. Brilliant. Um, well, I've no doubt that if you've said it, you'll do it because that's <laughs> that's what history tells us. Thanks ever so much. Um, that's been brilliant, brilliant chat to you um, and uh, really looking forward to see what the future holds. Thanks, oh, Audrey. Thank you, Jill. It's always lovely to chat to you. Great. <clears throat> thank you for listening to Fear Less, Do More. All of our guests come from a diverse range of backgrounds, but they all share a common drive to face their fears, take action and create meaningful impact. If you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast, please follow us at Square One Law on Instagram and LinkedIn and share the content with your friends, family and networks. Thank you and see you again on our next episode.